attendees are muted with their cameras off. And um, if you want to send in a question, you can submit it by clicking the little question mark icon. Uh, we will be answering questions at the end of the event and the recording will be distributed to all after the event. Um, a Q&A document will be um, generated of all the questions or, and we will be distributing that after the event. Um, so I think I will now get going and with, I will hand you over to Lee Carroll, who is head of SEAI's energy statistics team. Hi, Lee. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for the introduction. So welcome, welcome everybody on the call. So it's really great to be on the on the call this morning to talk about Energy in Ireland, which is uh, the stats team's premier or flagship report. So it really does aim to be a true farm to fork description of Ireland's energy landscape. It really, it, it looks to cover where Ireland's energy comes from, um, where it goes to and how it's used. And really, we're, we're really our ambition is to capture every kilogram of coal, every liter of oil, every cubic meter of gas, every unit of electricity on its journey around the country to build the most comprehensive picture of Ireland's energy landscape that we can. And uh, really that's, that's what we're, we're aiming to do. And that's really why Ireland, uh, the Energy in Ireland report really is the, the most definitive and comprehensive picture of Ireland's energy landscape. And everybody who's on today's call uh, has front row seats to, to get the, the first insights and uh, understand what the most interesting and important um, messages from that report are. So we prepared the following taster menu of the presentations uh, to whet your appetite and really to try to motivate you to make Energy in Ireland part of your, your Christmas holiday reading this season. The full report is 176 pages and contains thousands, tens of thousands of numbers. So really, this is just a, a kind of a, a taster of, of what's in there, really just to encourage you to, to pick up the report and, and leaf through it. So in my own 50 minute presentation, I'm going to talk us through the most interesting and important trends in 2022 and 2023. I'm going to try and deftly blend the definitive data we have from 2022 coming from SEAI's energy balance with provisional data from the first nine months of this year captured through our monthly surveys. And this is really to ensure that the, the highlights and the commentary that we have today are really as current and as now as possible. So really the first point to acknowledge and to quantify is the dependency of Ireland's energy supply. Like we are really heavily dependent on imports and heavily dependent on fossil fuels. In 2022, we imported 100% of our oil, 100% of our coal and 74% of our gas. And this means that just over 81% of our primary energy, import, energy was imported in total. And it also highlights that over 85% of our primary energy came from fossil fuels last year. And it really emphasizes the need for us to invest in national renewable generation. It really is a win-win. It strengthens both our energy security and our energy sovereignty. It insulates us from international price shocks and it reduces our energy emissions. And Cahill O'Cleary, our senior uh, energy analyst, he'll talk more to primary energy in his following presentation. But I'm going to zip right ahead now and look at where all that energy goes, or more accurately, how it's used in the Irish economy. So really, one of the best ways to get a quick and intuitive feel for energy demand across the country is to break it into three energy modes, electricity, heat and transport. And these three modes are defined in such a way that adding them together gives you 100% of Ireland's energy demand. So if I stack them like this, it really kind of gives you the, 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 total, the total profile of energy demand in the country for each year. And it's a great uh, to use a plot like this to understand and see kind of key features. So something obviously that, that pops off the screen here is the 11% drop that we experienced in 2020 uh, as energy demand reduced due to strong COVID impacts. And you can also see that the that energy demand has been rebounding ever since then. In fact, it increased by 4.7% in 2022. But despite that increase, you can see that we're still below our pre-COVID energy demand levels in 2018 and 2019. If you look kind of carefully, maybe if you squint a little bit at this plot, you'll notice that the energy demand drop in 2020 was almost entirely localized to the transport sector. If you kind of follow that dotted line there, you'll see that the sum of electricity and heat don't really show any significant change. And that's something we can see much more easily if we de-stack the three energy modes. Another key advantage to having the, the, the analysis broken down at that three levels um, at the high level. So if we do that, um, this representation really helps us show that the three different energy modes trend in different ways. 
And that's not really all that surprising. Um, there are very different types of energy and they, they service different parts of the economy. And it's really kind of a key reminder that you, you really can't just talk about energy in the round as one monolithic thing and expect things to make sense. You really do need to understand where that electricity is going and uh, what part of this, uh, what sector of the economy it services. So, for example, uh, we can see how COVID has impacted the three different energy modes uh, over the over the last few years. So, in transport, there was a sharp drop in 2020, a very partial rebound in 2021, and then a much stronger rebound in 2022. But over in electricity, there was no significant COVID impact to demand, either positive or negative. Really, what we just see is a linear increase in demand over the last eight to 10 years that you could almost set your watch by. And over in the third mode, heat, it's a little bit more of a roller coaster. And that's because heat demand is so weather dependent, especially in the residential sector. So there is far more year to year variation than in the other two modes. And it's genuinely quite hard to get a handle on underlying drivers of heat demand without first making a weather correction, which is something I'll cover at the end of my talk. So looking at the heat, electricity and transport mode, it's a great way to get into energy demand, but it's also a great way to understand energy emissions. Uh, because they all trend differently and they react differently to the pulse of the economy. We really can see that here. So the total energy emissions of Ireland were down by 0 0.6 megatons of CO2 in 2022, or down by 1.7% on the previous year. But not all energy modes contributed to that emission reduction equally. Heat emissions dropped by 1 million tons of CO2, 1 megaton of CO2 in 2022. There was a more modest reduction from electricity generation of 0 0.2 megatons, but an increase of 0 0.7 megatons from the transport uh, mode. And that's really due to the, the rebound in demand that I mentioned earlier. So it's important to understand that the net emission, uh, net reduction in emissions, energy emissions that we saw, that 0 0.6 megatons, comes from summing the reductions in heat and electricity with the increase in transport. So 2022 really is a story of two steps forward from heat and electricity and one step back from transport. In 2022, energy related emissions totaled 33.5 megatons of CO2, and they were split fairly evenly across all three modes with emissions from heating, just edging out transport and edging out electricity. And something that's maybe key to call out is the fact that 2022 had the lowest energy related emissions of any year in the last quarter century, except 2020, when the strongest COVID impacts were felt. However, the pace of emissions reductions is not sufficient to satisfy our national and international climate targets. And that's not just what the measured data in energy in Ireland is telling us. It's also what the projected data in SEAI's recently published National Energy Projection Report tells us too. And we're lucky to have uh, Emma Lynch on the call later today and, and presenting, who's the head of the SEAI's modeling team. And I'm sure she'll talk more to us about energy related emissions out to 2030. So zooming in for a few moments uh, on transport, we can use these three plots to show how COVID impacted diesel, petrol and jet kerosene differently. These three plots use definitive data from 2022 from the energy balance and, and blends it with the uh, and and also includes data from the, the first nine months of this year to extrapolate and to approximate uh, an end of year demand to 2023. And Dr. Emily Byrne, our new energy analyst, will speak more to SEI's analysis of monthly data in her presentation. But looking at the data on the screen, uh, what you can see is that diesel demand was the least impacted of, of all those fuel types and also the quickest to recover. And this because of the widespread use of diesel in the commercial fleet, which is less impacted by travel restrictions and work from home orders. And conversely, petrol, which is mainly used in the private car fleet, was impacted more strongly than diesel and was slower to rebound. And the sharp decline was driven by personal travel restrictions and work, uh, work from home and uh, school from home orders, and the slower recovery was due to the continuation of blended and hybrid working pat patterns for some for some workers. So of the three energy types or the fuel types here, it's very clear that jet kerosene demand dropped the most dramatically of them all. And this, of course, was due to international travel restrictions and travel hesitancy in the aftermath of COVID. So jet kerosene demand remained heavily suppressed in 2020 and 2021, but has very strongly rebounded in the last year in 2022. 
So using SEI's best estimates for 2023, uh, what we see is essentially a full rebound to pre-COVID levels of demand for all three fuel types and possibly the highest annual demand for jet kerosene ever in Ireland. And those rate rebounds, they have a big impact on Ireland's transport emissions. So the sectoral emission ceiling for transport in the first carbon budget is 54 megatons. And adding the official data from EPA from 2021 and 2022 to the best estimate from SCAI for 2023, well, that shows that just over 34 of those 54 megatons will already have been emitted by the end of 2023. And that leaves just 20 megatons in budget for 2024 and 2025, which corresponds to just under 10 megatons for each of those two years on average. And just for a little bit of context, we have never seen annual transport emissions that low even in 2020 with strong COVID impacts. So I guess it's also important to call out successes as well as the challenges we're facing in the sustainable transition. And one strong success is the increase of blended biofuels into our petrol and diesel. We've never had more biofuel being used in the transport sector. And SEAI estimates that biofuel use over the last, last decade has helped avoid over five megatons of emissions. That biofuel is slowly, slowly being the operative word, is, is slowly displacing more and more fossil fuels in transport. There's still a very long way to go. In 2022, just under 94% of road transport energy came from fossil fuels. But as we rolled out, or as we roll out E10 blended petrol in 2023 and B12 and B20 blended diesels uh, in line with cap actions in the future, we will see further displacement of fossil fuels from our roads. There's also a strong momentum in the rollout of EVs, especially battery EVs uh, that run exclusively from electrical charging. And very broadly speaking, in recent years, we've seen 50% uh, more EVs on the road each year. And we need that exponential growth to continue in order to hit our 2025 and 2030 EV targets. So CAP calls for just under 20,000 EVs by 2025 and 950 EVs by 2030. And we have Shane Prendergast uh, on, on the call, or rather in the chat, from SEAI's EV team. If you have any questions about EVs, he's really the man to, man to ask. It's great to have an, an expert on board with us. Uh, I'm trying to go quickly, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try and keep the time and move on to electricity. So Ireland's annual electricity supply has increased steadily over the last eight to ten years. Uh, the average increase uh, is about 2.2% per annum, which means that in 2023, we were using about 25% more electricity than we did a decade ago. But where is all that electricity going? I mean, has there been a general increase in demand from all sectors of the economy? Well, in a word, no. Uh, our analysis shows that electricity demand growth has been strongly localized to the commercial services sector. And furthermore, that the electricity demand growth has been localized more specifically to the information and communication subsector of the economy. Outside of the information and communication subsector, electricity demand growth in the country has just has been 2% in the last two years, uh, in the last 10 years. So that's not 2% for the last 10 years, that's 2% in the last 10 years. While Electricity demand in the information and communication subsector has increased by 560%. What this means is that essentially all increased electricity demand over the last 10 years has come from this one subsector. And 82% of that subsector's electricity demand is due to data centers. So this analysis really does highlight that the key role that data centers are playing in increasing Ireland's electricity demand and why it's so critical that we, uh, that, uh, why it's so critically important that electricity demands are compatible and synced to the rollout of renewable generation. So that's really a light speed summary of where our electricity is going. Um, you will find much more detail, much more numbers, and much more, more commentary in the report itself. But where is all that electricity coming from? Well, in 2022, Ireland generated nearly 34 terawatt hours of electricity with just under half, 49.2% coming from gas generation and 38.9% of our electricity coming from renewables. 85% of that renewable electricity came from wind generation and SEAI analysis indicates that all of that renewable electricity helped avoid 5.5 megatons of CO2 from fossil generation. 
Ireland currently just has just under 4.6 gigawatts of installed capacity, practically all of it onshore, and we have ambitious plans to increase that capacity guided by our cap targets. We are targeting six gigawatts of onshore capacity by 2025, which will require us to add 30% 30 30 more capacity than we currently have in the next two years. And we are targeting 14 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2030, which will require us to triple our current capacity with a significant fraction of that going offshore over the next seven years. And we're lucky to have in SEAI and on the call, John McCann, who's an internationally recognized expert on wind. So again, if you have any uh, wind related questions, you can drop them into the chat and John will do his level best to, to answer them there. So another really important source of electricity, particularly in 2023, was the imports through our international interconnectors. So 2023 saw a very significant increase in the use of imported electricity. And this was mainly driven by UK, price, uh, UK carbon prices trading at a steep discount with respect to those in the EU, which made it cheaper to import electricity from fossil generation in the UK uh, compared to generating it uh, indigenously here, here in Ireland. And this is really important because imported electricity through the lens of the national greenhouse gas inventory and the carbon budgets is emission free. So having large quantities of imported electricity drives down the, the electricity emissions. And that's really clear from the, for the next slides I'm going to show. So the sectoral emission ceiling for electricity in the first carbon budget is 40 megatons. And if we add together the official data from the EPA from 2021 to 2022, with SEAI's best estimate for 2023, which indicates a 25% reduction on the previous year. Then we see that about 27 megatons uh, of the 40 megatons will have been emitted by the end of 2023. And that leaves just 13 megatons in budget for 2024 and 2025, or an average of 6.5 megatons per year for each of those years. And again, for context, that is lower than any annual emission from electricity we've seen. I'm on the last lap of this whistle stop tour, so I, I hope you're still with me. Uh, I'm going to finish up by looking at Ireland's heat demand, which is really important in 2022, primarily because it was the lead contributor to our drop in energy emissions. So we really want to understand where that drop came from and what drove it. So the heat mode covers everything from cooking to the heating of our homes, schools and businesses to the high temperature processes used in, in chemical manufacturing or, or material manufacturing. And there was a 7.3% drop in total heat demand across the economy in 2022. But that drop was not evenly distributed across the economy. Most of that heat demand reduction was localized to the residential sector, which dropped by about 3.5 terawatt hours on the previous year, or about 13.8% down on the previous year, 2021 value. So digging down, we can see drops across all of the energy products in the residential sector, except renewables. And I'll circle back to that in a second. We're seeing double digit drops in demand for oil, peat and coal. And that's really key to explaining the big drop in heat emissions that we saw. All of those fuels, oil, peat and coal are highly carbon intense and any reduction in their use has a, a kind of a significantly greater impact on the reduction in emissions. But what drove those widespread reductions in residential heat demand? Well, before digging any deeper, it's critically important to recognize that residential heat demand is fundamentally weather dependent. So whenever we experience short or mild winters uh, or both, uh, we both need and use less heating and that drives down the demand. And weather dependency really adds a very significant noise to the residential uh, heat demand data. And it makes it difficult to see any underlying economic or behavioral driver uh, that's, that's working away in the background. So what SEAI does is it uses uh, heating degree days from Met Aaron to make a first order weather correction to the residential heat demand. And it helps uncover those underlying drivers. And it's important to kind of call out that the correction is not just a tweaking around the edges. It, it really does make a substantive difference to the residential heating data. For example, in the uncorrected heat demand data, we see a 13.8% reduction in residential heat demand in 2022, but in the corrected data, the reduction is just 7.3%. So that's kind of showing that weather effects were responsible for fully half of the reduction that we saw in 2022. But that might beg the question of what happened to the other half. Well, there uh, we do need to do a little bit of digging. So uh, some of the clues we get are come from differentiating the weather corrected residential heat demand data. 
And actually the first clue is, is several years in the past, it's back in 2020, when we observed an 11% increase in residential heat demand. And we believe this mainly be to be due to COVID impacts, forcing us to spend more time at home and therefore use more heat energy there. And then in 2021, we see, just as we saw a rebound in transport, we see a rebound in heat demand reduction as people move from return, sorry, move from working at home to, to returning to the office. And crucially, this reduction came before we started to experience the significant price increases. So it really is very likely that it was return to office and return to school behaviors driving that effect. And our uh, senior energy analyst, Mary Holland, she'll cover more about energy prices in her session later today. But the drop that we saw of 7.7% .7 in 2022 was likely due to a combination of continuing return to office effects and price effects. It's not really possible for us to fully decouple the, the RTO and the price effects at this time, but they're likely to be comparable uh, drivers of the reduction. And this comes from us looking at the expected price elasticity of energy demand and also data from the CSO on commuting traffic. And really, we're going to need a little bit more time, and especially more data, to, to fully decouple those effects. But before I, I close up today, I'm just going to return to that point that I mentioned a few minutes ago about seeing an increase of renewable energy in the heating of Irish homes. And the SEAI data tells us that heat pumps now account for 4% of all residential heat. And they are displacing more and more fossil fuels from residential heating. But again, there is a very long way to go to decarbonize residential heating. In 2022, fossil fuels still accounted for 94% of heat demand in Irish homes. Um, and so kind of just aligning with the, the recent announcement from COP, we, we, we really do need to see this transition away from fossil fuels. It's happening, but the, the pace really needs to be accelerated hugely, uh, both for heating and for the fossil fuels used in transport. So now I'm going to hand over to Cahill, uh, who's going to teach us or tell us about how energy takes a journey uh, through, through the supply chain gets from primary supply to final energy demand and uh, all that happens along the way. So over to you, Cahill. Thanks very much, Lee. Uh, <clears throat> so um, today I'm just going to go through the supply transformation and consumption of energy uh, within Ireland with a particular focus on 2022. Um, Excuse me for one minute while I something. The um geez. okay, so I'm going to start with um first step in the chain, which is I suppose the primary energy supply into the country, which includes the indigenous production of energy products within Ireland, uh the import of energy products, and also taking account of the export. Um we'll then briefly discuss the transformation processes um, in Ireland. This is mostly consists of electricity generation and uh, oil refining. And then we'll look at the final energy consumption, uh, also referred to as final energy use or final energy demand. And this is where energy products are used within the sectors of the economy. And um, final energy use can be come directly from primary energy or it can be uh, energy type that has come through a transformation process like electricity. So first, um, I'd like to look here at a Sankey diagram, which shows the energy flows in Ireland in 2022. Each node or the solid rectangle here uh, represents a stage in the energy supply from primary energy on the left to final consumption on the right. And the links between the nodes represent the flow of energy between each stage. Uh, the height of the flow or node shows the quantity of energy in 2022. So the taller um, flows shows more quantity of energy. Uh, starting on the left-hand side, we have the supply of primary energy into Ireland. You can see oil uh, has the largest share, primary energy all the way down as far as uh, net electricity imports. Um, next uh, section here in the in the center is the uh, energy transformation processes, electricity generation here, uh, oil refining, and a small amount of peat briquetting that took place in 2022. 
um, and you can see the uh, transformation and distribution transmission losses associated with those processes. Most of those losses are associated with electricity generation. And finally, on the right-hand side, we have uh, final energy consumption. So this is where the final uh, energy types are distributed to amongst the, um, the sectors of the economy. And uh, really, the Energy in Ireland report provides additional detail on more or less every node within this uh, chart. So if you're looking for additional breakdowns uh, between fuel types or, or subsectors of the economy, it's available in the Energy in Ireland report. So uh, just now I'd like to cover primary energy um, in 2022 in Ireland, so the primary supply of energy in 2022. Here we have a bubble plot which um, shows the primary energy supply and the size of the bubbles or the circles uh, represents the quantity of energy. So each row here is a um, particular energy flow. We have indigenous production on the top, which refers to the extraction of an energy type, the first extraction of an energy type from a natural source or from a recovery from a waste. We then have imports, exports, and finally uh, stock changes and marine bunkers. Uh, marine bunkers covers uh, fuel used in international uh, shipping. Um, I suppose what jumps off the page and what Lee alluded to earlier is the high quantity of imports here. So um, if we take it as a percentage of, of, of primary energy supply, imports make up 93.7%, um, slightly less for looking at net imports, like I think Lee did earlier. But it really shows how, how dependent Ireland is on those imports. Uh, in particular, there's the oil and gas, which, as you can see here, it's, it's almost 84% uh, of Ireland's primary supply of energy comes from imported oil and gas. And um, we also we can see here that the, our indigenous production is is uh, made up of peat, some small amount of peat, natural gas, renewables, and a small amount of non-renewable waste. And uh, we can see here that renewables um, are, are now the largest fuel aggregate fuel type or energy type within the indigenous production. So that's uh, the largest contributor there, of course, is uh, wind power generation. So if we sum those energy flows up, we end up with the primary energy requirement, as it's called, which is the amount of primary energy required for Ireland in 2022. And it excludes non-energy uses of, of any of these products like bitumen for roads, et cetera. So this shows that Ireland required 167 uh, terawatt hours of energy split out amongst the, uh, the energy types here. Uh, we can see that oil and natural gas over 79% of the primary energy requirement. Um, and that renewables is around is at around 13% of uh, the primary energy requirement. So next I'd like to touch on um, transformation. And in this context, I'd like to look at the uh, electricity transformation. So the source primer, the uh, the electricity, the flow of electricity through transformation and tr into distribution and final consumption of electricity. And um, overall uh, transformation efficiency. So starting on the left hand side, sorry, is the uh, primary energy uh, that flows into the electricity system. We have uh, the direct and uh, non-combustible renewables at the top, wind, hydro, solar. We also have imports there, which flow directly into the electricity supply. And then we have the combustibles underneath, which are obviously fossil fuels, but also some combustible renewables. So there's the next process is the next stage in the in the flow is the transformation step. And this covers or shows the relatively large amount of transformation losses that occur and the overall efficiency of Ireland's generation uh, in 2022 was around 61%. So that's across all um, energy input types, primary energy input types. And following that, we, we have some other energy uses and losses. So that includes uh, transmission and distribution losses, own use within uh, the power generation sector, pump storage losses, but also um, small amount of exports and some 
uh, transformation, other transformation processes. And then we have the final energy use here by sector. So here we have uh, the, the, the lead user is the services sector, as I think Lee mentioned earlier, followed by residential, then industry, and then uh, agricultural fisheries, fisheries and transport consume a small amount as well. So finally, I'd uh, um, like to look at the final energy consumption. So uh, here we're looking at a summation of uh, final energy consumption in Ireland in 2022. So this is uh, includes all sectors of the economy. And you can see Ireland consumed 140 terawatt hours. And um, over 78% is not electricity. So it's worth noting that you know, almost four in every five units of final energy consumption is not electricity. I know we we tend to think of electricity of, as having a, lar uh, a very large role in final energy consumption. It does have a very important role, but it, again, there is a huge amount of consumption that is not electricity. So if we break out the previous diagram uh, um, between the sectors of the economy, so here we've expanded it, so each row shows a sector of the economy from industry, transport, residential, commercial, and public services, down to agriculture and fisheries, and broken out by each fuel type again. Uh, just to point out that in electricity, uh, in the final column, you can see the uh, green segment shows the um, renewable percentage of the electricity uh, in final consumption. So, what jumps off the page here, I suppose, is that if we look at the combinations of fuel types and sectors, we can see that oil use and transport is really uh, is far larger than anything else um, at 55.4 terawatt hours, and um, followed by oil use in residential. And then we have um, electricity use in commercial. This is following in order of size sending order of size, then have uh, natural gas in the industrial sector. And really you can see that oil plays a large role in not the, not the largest role in every sector, but uh, a significant role in every sector. And um, if we combine that with natural gas as well, uh, we can see the two combined do contribute in, in, the, in almost every sector of the economy. We also have renewables here, which refers to the direct consumption of renewables. So this is um, things like uh, solar thermal, ambient heat and heat pumps, biomass, biofuels, and um, of course, renewable electricity will be cons is is counted in this electricity column here uh, on the right hand side. So just to highlight that. Uh, Transport and residential sector consume over 64% of our final energy consumption. And um, now just to look at like how this ties in with government policies, the policies that are outlined in CAP, if we look at the energy consumption in the residential sector and we highlight the, the fossil fuels here, coal, peat, oil, and gas, we look to reduce them via home em energy upgrades and then to shift um, energy consumption from these fossil fuels over to renewables, direct renewables, and also electricity uh, by use of heat pumps and district heating. And then if we look similarly at transport, the policies here will be sort of active travel to reduce the demand, energy demand and transport, economies of scale and public transport, and also better spatial planning, and also to replace some of that energy consumption with blended biofuels, and also to replace the vehicles themselves with electric vehicles. So uh, finally, I'd like to look at just briefly the renewable energy share uh, of final consumption in Ireland. So this is referred to as the overall res or renewable energy share. And just uh, this line here shows um, Ireland's performance over the last few years. We can see that Ireland is up to 13.1% of final energy consumption. And uh, that's a slight improvement over 2021, but not quite at the levels of 2020. Uh, and the important thing to note here is that the largest contribution here is, is renewables and electricity. 
then followed by renewables and heat, and then renewables and transport. So just to zoom out on, on the previous graph here, if we look at where we are now versus where we need to get to, the dotted gray line shows Ireland's current uh, uh, trajectory, target trajectory for the overall res, which goes to 34.1% in 2030. Obviously, there's a long way to go. And um, one thing that's important to note is that that is likely to increase with a recent amendment to the EU legislation, but um, that the exact size of the increase is yet to be determined. Sorry, apologies, I skipped out there. Finally, just to point out that in the Energy in Ireland report, there's further details and breakdown of the renewable energy shares within each of the modes. That's the Res E or renewable energy share in electricity, Res T in transport, and the Res H in heat. And uh, next, I'd like to hand over to the senior energy statistician, uh, Mary Holland, who will talk you through um, the energy prices. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Cahill. Um, hope everybody can hear me okay. So yeah, my name is Mary Holland and I'm here to present today on electricity and gas prices uh, in 2022 and 2023. So we all know that over the last couple of years, we've seen unprecedented energy prices. And to cushion these price increases, the government has introduced a, a suite of supports to help manage these higher costs. So first we'll have a look at the household supports that have been put in place. So we saw a VAT reduction from 13.5% to 9% from May, 2022, and that was recently extended to the end of October 2024. We've also seen uh, various account credits. We've had four account credits on our electricity bills of 200 euro, and the recent budget announced a further three account credits of 150 euro each, this is to a total savings of 1,250 euro on our household electricity bills. There have also been business supports uh, with different supports depending on the scale uh, and type of business impacted. So we saw the Ukraine Enterprise Crisis Schemes 1 and 2 administered by Enterprise Ireland and also the TBES, the Temporary Business Energy Support Scheme, and this ran from 2022 and expired last September. I just want to note on today's uh, presentation, uh, we collect our electricity and ga gas prices from suppliers um, and we create a weighted average for the final prices. Um, and as household supports were administered by suppliers uh, through household bills, we have data on this in our energy, surprise, energy prices. But for the business supports, as they were administered by Enterprise Ireland and revenue, these are not accounted for in the business price presented today. So before I actually talk about um, the actual prices, so it's really important to be clear on what is being measured. So most of us are familiar with the unit price of electricity and gas on our bills, but it's really not an ideal uh, measure of the true cost of energy. So in line with uh, international be pra best practice, we talk about the effective unit price of energy. So not only does this account for the unit charge, it also incorporates the standing charges, uh, the taxes and levies, and minus any account credits. So this is a final price paid by the household and includes the direct price supports in our bills. So now we'll just have a look at some of the price data we have. And the most recent prices we have are for the first half of 2023. So this is January to June 2023. So you can see here, these are the gas prices to households. And as the prices are collected every six months, there is a seasonal a seesaw effect. So we also have smoothed that out in a 12 month average in the green line. So you can see that the significant price increases for households there in the second half of 2022. And we've seen a, a doubling, more than a doubling of prices over the last two years. And now if you look at, at, at uh, gas prices to business, so we see something similar, but however, there are some differences. So 
first of all, the significant price incre increases arrived earlier. Um, and secondly, have the price increases larger over the last two years and it's been from home for homes. And we've also seen in the last first semester 2021 that the prices are coming down. And a uh, reason for these differences is because business prices are typically more, they're closely tied to the wholesale price of gas. And then they're more sensitive to wholesale shifts. So they're faster to increase, but also uh, faster to recover too. And we can see here something similar for electricity prices to business, where the price increases came earlier. Uh, we can see again a, a doubling over, over two years. Um, and we know with electricity prices, the significant portion of electricity is generated from natural gas. So the price, uh, wholesale price changes there also have an effect on the electricity prices to business. So now I'm going to move on to uh, household electricity prices. So similar graph to what we, we have before with the bars showing the price per semester and the lines smoothing out any seasonal effects and up to the first half of 2023. So we can see that prices over the last two years increased by 16%. Now, um, this is very different to the pricing changes in other, other sectors. So, um, and this is because the price inc includes, this is the effective unit price. So it allows for the account credits. And now the way that we collect our prices, we have various levels of prices. So we're actually able to see the negative price component which came about from the application of these multiple 200 euro credits. And this allows us to actually uh, estimate the counterfactual without account credits or the VAT reductions. And you can see how electricity prices would, increased, would have increased significantly without these account credits. And we've actually um, uh, produced a blog on this, which is on our website, um, which goes into more detail on this. So before I move on to international comparisons, it's very important to uh, look at how you know the, the same euro coin spends differently in Ireland than in Luxembourg and in Portugal. So we use purchasing power parity. So these uh, compare the price levels for a basket of comparable goods and service services to the representative consumption patterns in in various countries. And so comparing. Uh, energy prices directly can be misleading. So this is very important to account for this ability to pay when comparing prices. And it's more sophisticated and robust just than a simple GDP GNP normalization. And there are various uh, uh, levels of normalization. And this is this just um, you know, takes into this purchasing power parity is taken into account, you know, the relative cost of living and the inflation rates of, of different countries. And it's really a valuable tool for comparing uh, energy prices. So first of all, let's have a look. Uh, so these PPPs are more relevant for household prices. So if you look at our household electricity, similar graph to before, and we have a new 12-month uh, average, the blue line for the EU. So when looking through the lens of the PPP prices, you can see that the average household in Ireland pays less than the EU average for electricity. And you can also see how the recent increases are mirrored in the EU average. And if we look at gas, again, through the lens of PPP, we see that historically we've actually paid less than the, the EU average, although that has changed in the last year or so, and now we are paying approximately the same as the EU average. So all of this data is available on our website. We recently published a report on prices up to the first half of 2023. Um, and this breaks out the prices, as you mentioned, electricity and natural gas, household and business. And there are various consumption bans for each category as defined in the regulation uh, for reporting to Eurostat. So this data goes back to 2007, so it provides for a long time series for longitudinal analysis. And also once a year with the price collection for the second half of the year, we also collect a breakdown of the price components and tax disaggregation. And this allows us for international comparison and rankings, which are all included in this report. We also produce uh, other price outputs. So we have our fuel cost comparisons with compares of various fuels used for space heating and they're a very popular download on our uh, website. 
So please, please um, go to the statistics section on the website and you'll see all these downloads there. And now that's that's the end of my presentation on, on prices. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Emily Byrne, for the next section. Thanks, Mary. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. My name is Emily Byrne, and I will be speaking about enhancing um, how we've been enhancing SEAI's energy outputs in terms of website data and material, what's currently available, and what we plan to make available in the near future. So, before I jump into my section of this presentation, uh, I think it's important to reiterate just how important the definitive data that uh, Cahill has presented on is. It is, and Lee also, uh, it's our gold standard, which we use to calculate our official res results, and it's a key input into the calculation of the carbon budgets, as you saw. Um, but to achieve this level of granularity and accuracy, that means that it's slow and it's released uh, nine months after the end of the year in question. On the other hand, the pace of the timelines associated with um, our targets and budgets means that fast provisional data complements our slower definitive data. It essentially gives us an early indication of what's coming down the tracks. But it's also important to note that the sum of 12 months of monthly data um, will not superimpose onto the annual data value because of the differences in scope in the data sources. For example, monthly electricity data covers electricity exported to the grid from generator stations, and so it doesn't cover industry auto producers, for example. Um, however, when its benefits and limitations are understood, it can be an extremely valuable source of close to real time information. And this monthly energy data is currently available on the SAI website within one to two months. And it's split into three sections, into electricity, oil and gas. And in the following slides, I'll take you through a few examples of what you can find there. So for each of these graphs, previous years are coloured in shades of blue, uh, but to help the most recent years stand out, 2022 is coloured yellow and 2023 is coloured orange. The bars show you the data as it comes in month by month. Um, you can see that it's generally quite choppy, but here you can already identify a monthly or seasonal variation even prior to any further statistical analysis. And this is something that the annual data generally doesn't have as much vision on. Black line then indicates the 12 month rolling average value, which smooths monthly and seasonal variation and helps identify any sustained trends in the data. And when we look at monthly electricity generation from wind, uh, for example, we can see this seasonal variation within the pattern of of peaks and troughs in the bar chart. And we can also see that the 12 month rolling average value up until September of this year was a record for electricity generation from wind. <clears throat> in contrast, when we look at electricity generation from coal, it had been trending downwards since 2017 and even fell to zero for a number of months in 2019 and 2020 did return in 2021 and 2022 due to low wind uh, generation and outages in gas fired uh, power stations. But it does appear as though its return was short lived um, as it's returned to a relatively low base in 2023. Staying with the electricity for a moment, um, you can, we can also look at imports and exports on a monthly basis. The darker shade of orange here represents imports and the lighter shade of orange represents exports. The black line in this case represents the net import of electricity for a given month. So you've heard Lee mentioned that Ireland has imported a lot of electricity in 2023. And this plot indicates that Ireland hasn't seen this level of sustained net import of electricity for around 10 years. 
Moving away from electricity to oil and taking a plot of monthly deliveries of motor petrol, uh, for example, you can see that between 2016 and 2019, there was a gradual decline in petrol deliveries. Then when we highlight uh, this period between 2020 and 2021, you can clearly see the strong, in, strong impact that travel restrictions had on petrol demand. And I think a, a key point to pick out here is that these were short, sharp shocks to petrol deliveries, which were localized to particular months of the year. But outside of these months, petrol generally made relatively fast rebounds. And in 2023, there were months where petrol deliveries were spiking back to pre-COVID levels once again. For monthly deliveries of road diesel, you can see the similar impact that travel restrictions had on diesel demand, which uh, again isolated uh, these dips to particular months of the year. So once again, these monthly insights can help to give additional context to the definitive annual data. I've only shown uh, examples of motor petrol and road diesel here, but on the website, the same can be done for other oil products such as heating or jet kerosene, for example. Then finally, moving to gas. Um, here we can see the total gas supply to Ireland, which is made up of indigenous production from the Corrib gas fields in green, uh, imports in blue, and stock change in red. Indigenous production peaked in 2017 as the Corrib came fully online, but as is natural for gas field, uh, it has been declining since then. And as a result of this, imports have been increasing in order to keep the total gas supply to Ireland relatively constant, and so we're becoming more heavily dependent on imported gas. You've heard Lee say that in 2022, uh, gas imports accounted for 74% of the total gas supply to Ireland. Um, but you can see in the past that there have been in instances uh, during periods of scheduled maintenance at the gas terminal where imports have accounted for up to 91% of the gas supply to Ireland. So that gives a very quick overview of the monthly data uh, that's already available on the website. This was only a very small snapshot of what is there. So I encourage you to have a look uh, to see the full depth of what is available. Next, I'll move on uh, to show you how we've used this provisional but valuable monthly data to release a new note which is called the Half Year Review of Ireland's Energy and Related Emissions. Uh, the note compares the first six months of 2023 to the same period in previous years. And in areas related to electricity generation or road transport, for example, and we hope to make this, uh, this note a part of our recurring notes in our annual publication portfolio. We've also revamped our conversion factor page, which I hope you'll agree is easier to navigate and has more downloadable information available. You can now download um, calorific values, emission factors, densities and primary energy factors on solid, liquid and gaseous fuels and free electricity generation and consumption where it's relevant. Aside from these, uh, we're also working on bringing annual data on supply transformation and demand and also on energy prices into interactive data panels uh, for the website. You'll be able to change units, customize selections, select time periods and toggle over areas of interest uh, for more information, for example. So I'm pleased to say that we will have uh, some new and interactive data coming to the website soon as well. Finally, the last thing that I'll leave you with before I hand over to my colleague Niall are the series of videos that some uh, of the team have been working on. This series consists of five one minute videos containing condensed, easily digestible and visually impactful information, each followed by a short quiz and they're dedicated to bringing energy statistics to younger audiences. So at this point, I'd like you to take uh, a look at uh, the, these new additions to the website and I'll hand you over to my colleague, Niall. Thanks very much, Emily. Um, so I'm just going to speak now about some of the energy mapping work that we do 
as part of the statistics team in SEAI. So we have been involved for, for many years in energy mapping. And until recently, our, our main activities in this area would have been the hosting of several online mapping resources. And so some of these would have proved very popular over the years. Uh, our, our wind atlas, for example, is probably our flagship map. And it's been very useful for wind farm developers in, in the planning of new sites in Ireland. Um, but we do have a whole suite of maps available online uh, for different energy related themes, ranging from heat demand to BER ratings, uh, and then as well, a recently added solar atlas this year as well. Uh, but in recent times, though, we've kind of expanded our strategy for energy mapping. Um, Emily just spoke there about some of the different innovations in, in Irish energy statistics. Uh, and another example of this is, is, a, is the addition of the spatial dimension to the data. In other words, we're not just looking at how much energy Ireland uses as a whole or for what purpose, uh, but we're also starting to look now at where specifically within Ireland that energy is being used and then using those insights to inform uh, planning and action as well. So the annual energy balance and the Energy in Ireland report, they both speak about energy at a national level, uh, but behind the scenes, we're also now providing a lot of information and analysis of data at these re regional and community levels as well. Uh, so understanding energy at the national level, it's fundamentally important in informing government policy and also monitoring progress towards national targets and EU obligations. Um, but ultimately, a lot of the planning and actions happen at the level of local authorities and communities. Um, so we do need to be able to, to provide data specifically for those levels as well. Uh, but just to give a better idea of the scales of these regional and community levels, um, there's obviously one country, uh, but we can divide that up into 31 local authorities. And then we can divide, further divide those local authorities up into these 19,000 or so census divisions. Uh, and at that point, the data is really about as, as, as granular as you can get. And you can see just by the map on the right there, um, just how fine a spatial resolution the, the census small area really is. Uh, but just to focus first on the, the local authorities, the main resource we have for su supplying data for local authorities is the LA CAP dashboard. Um, so local authorities are currently mandated to prepare their own climate action plans, which outline mitigation and adaptation measures that they intend to take uh, in their areas in the next five years uh, against climate change. So this dashboard was originally intended as a, as a means of providing whatever data we have available on, on various energy related themes um, to help them prepare those plans. Um, so at the moment, the dashboard currently has seven themes. So for example, if you click into the home energy upgrades tab, uh, you get a breakdown of all the grant funding in each local authority that's been provided to homeowners over the years to help them upgrade the energy efficiency of their homes. Um, so that would include figures for the, the new one-stop shop scheme uh, or, say, the, the fully funded upgrades that are, that are given to more di disadvantaged demographics as well. And similarly, then, if you were to click on the domestic BER ratings you, tab, you could get a breakdown of, say, how many A-rated homes are in a local authority or how many C-rated homes there are. Um, but as I said, we've got seven different themes of data in there, uh, and we try to update that once a month with all the data being available to download as a spreadsheet as well. Uh, and another way we use energy mapping is in informing planning around district heating in Ireland. And this is really where you're getting down to the, the, the fine spatial resolution. So as we heard earlier, a, a significant amount of energy in Ireland is used for heat. And at the moment, most of that heat comes from non-renewable resources. And, one of the ways Ireland is looking at decarbonizing the heating sector is through district heating. Um, so at the moment, when, when most people switch on their heating, uh, typically a gas or an oil boiler uh, will heat the water that circulates to the radiators in the house. Uh, but if you were on a district heating network, you wouldn't necessarily have your own individual boiler, but the water for you and everyone else on the network would be heated at an energy center elsewhere, and then it would circulate to your home through a piping network. So it's basically a, a form of centralized heating. Um, it's, it's relatively new to Ireland, but it's, it's well established in other European countries like Denmark, uh, where district heating provides heat to over 60% of the homes there. Uh, and now Ireland has targets set down in CAP to provide 2.7 terawatt hours a year of heat, which is equivalent roughly to about 9% of heat 
um, for the residential and service sectors. Um, so that target, those targets are set for 2030. But energy mapping is going to be very useful in planning Ireland's district heating networks because not all the areas are going to be suitable for this type of renewable heat. Um, so in the image we're looking at here, uh, we're looking at Waterford City. Uh, and what we're mapping here is the demand for heat. So as a rule of thumb, when planning district heating, you ideally want to look for places where you have a large demand for heat in a, in a relatively small physical space. And this is known as heat density. And, and that's what you're seeing here. So towards the center of the image, um, you've got this relatively high heat density where you probably have all the, the retail shops, the restaurants, uh, the office blocks. Uh, and then more towards the outskirts, you have these two sort of independent areas where you have a, a very high density of heat demand. Um, so the one on the left here, this, this area is, is Waterford IT. Uh, and then the one on the right, right is uh, Waterford University Hospital. So you can see by just being able to map out the different heat demands in that area, we can start to build up a, a clearer picture of what Ireland's future district heating networks might look like and what areas might be included in the, within them. And then the last piece of energy, energy mapping work that I want to talk about is just the spatial disaggregation of SEAI grants. So since 2015, SEAI have given grant funding to homeowners for over 200,000 property upgrades in the country. Uh, and that equates to roughly 750 million euro. Uh, but this year, we put a lot of time, in, time and effort into setting up processes that allow us to map all of these grants to the census small area level. And as I said before, there's about 19,000 of these areas now. Uh, so it really is a high spatial resolution, but it allows us to see exactly how these grants are being distributed geographically. And similarly then we've done this with grants for electric vehicles as well. Uh, and then you can imagine all the planning of infrastructure that's gonna be required in coming years to accommodate for the increasing share of electric vehicles on the road. Um, but the people responsible for this planning will get great insight out of being able to visualize the geographic spread of EV uptake. And then just one final point to note here, um, the CSO recently published their small area population statistics for the 2022 census. Um, so not only now can we visualize the geographic spread of SEAI grants, but we can also now link grant uptake to social demographics as well. And it'll be interesting to see now uh, like if there's any particular demographics that are more likely to upgrade their homes than others or if say the length of time spent commuting means that you're that you'd be more likely to buy an electric vehicle uh, and this kind of linking is going to be very important in ensuring that as ireland undergoes this revolution in energy in energy use in the future and um, that there is this just transition for all social demographics involved um, so if you have any questions then about any of the mapping work that we do in seai please feel free to put them in the chat there and i'll do my best to answer them uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to pass you over now to Emma Lynch, who's the head of our energy modelling team, and is going to talk a little bit about what the future of, of Irish energy use looks like. Thanks, Niall. So, uh, yeah, good afternoon. I'm Emma Lynch. Uh, I'm here to present on our, our modelled energy projections. So my colleagues from the energy statistics team have brought us well up to date uh, with our energy data and where we are now at the close of 2023. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in SEI to look forward and assess possible energy outcomes for Ireland out to 2030 and beyond. So the objective of the energy balance is to take in the latest finalized energy data and update our historic account of Ireland's energy supply and consumption. And Cahill talked us through those energy flows earlier in the presentation and, and those reflected in the energy balance give us our starting point in modeling. Uh, and we model a range of possible outcomes for future supply and consumption in Ireland. So as we've seen from the prior presenters today, uh, Energy in Ireland combines that energy balance data with the latest available data for the first nine months of the year and extrapolates that out to the end of the year to give us the most timely insights on how our present energy data is shaping up. Uh, this data helps us as modelers then to inform the seam between the actual historic data and the modeled projections for future years. So there's a degree of uncertainty then in, in this near term picture and it's solidified over time, but it does give us a sound foundation for projected data. Now on the modeling side of things, 
the uncertainty grows as we project further into Ireland's future, but that's the objective for us in modeling and the purpose of the national energy projections. So the national energy projections are an annual output from SEI's modeling team, uh, which form the energy component of the EPA's national greenhouse gas emissions projections, and they're submitted to the EU in March of each year. And they give us a picture of how Ireland's likely to progress against our own targets and in our contribution to European targets. So we're currently producing the next set of projections, which will use the historic data you've seen today and look forward to 2030 and beyond. Um, the primary focus of the projections is the near-term horizon out to 2030, uh, as the bulk of current policy is focused on those 2030 targets, but we also model as far out as 2050, just to get a view on that potential longer-term trends and carry over for any possible delays in meeting the 2030 targets. Now, we can't have a crystal clear vision of the future, um, and the purpose of modeling is really more to provide us kind of road signs for possible trajectories uh, with varying degrees of likelihood under a range of conditions. So due to the uncertainty in the evolution of underlying economic conditions, uh, technology progression and uh, timelines for implementation of policy, we model multiple scenarios in our projections um, given that kind of uncertainty. So one of the main scenarios is the with existing measures scenario or the WEM. The WEM scenario is a projection of future energy consumption based on policies and measures that are currently implemented and actions committed to by government. So to become part of the WEM scenario, the measure has to be in place by the end of the previous historic year, and the scenario doesn't assume that there's any implementation of new policies after that point. Uh, the WAM scenario, the with additional measures scenario, is more ambitious. It's a projection of our future uh, energy use based on the measures outlined in the latest government plans. Um, at the time that we produce the projections. So it includes everything in the WEM, uh, but also uh, includes those in latest government plans that may not be fully implemented yet. Uh, so for example, the WAM includes the target of that 945 KEVs on the road by 2030 in CAP 23. Um, in addition to these scenarios, then we often also look at accompanying sensitivity scenarios to understand the potential impact of variations on underlying economic conditions. Uh, or the evolution of policy implementation on Ireland's future energy use and associated emissions. Uh, this, these sensitivities can include, for example, kind of varying fossil fuel price forecasts, uh, delays in technology rollout, such as offshore wind capacity, uh, also potential risks to implementation of planned policy that's still in the stages of road mapping to the full cap target amount. Uh, for instance, the district heating, um, as Niall just mentioned, or the biomethane rollout. Uh, so this allows us to anticipate any risk and kind of look for solutions in advance to try to mitigate that risk as, as soon as possible and be as transparent as we can about um, what the, the future range of um, scenarios can look like. So in November, we published our National Energy Projections Report, which was a follow-on to the EPA's Emissions Projections Report published earlier in the year and provides a kind of deep dive into the, uh, the energy component. So it highlighted uh, some overall kind of key messages and also provided sector by sector analysis of critical success factors and risks to be aware of for Ireland's energy future. Uh, the starting point for that report was the historic data set from the previous Energy in Ireland report. But as I mentioned, we're currently working on the next set of energy projections, which will take into account the updated historic data you've, you've heard about here today. And the new projections data set will be available from Q1 of 2024. Uh, so I wanted to mention a few of the key overall messages from that report uh, today for the overall energy picture, uh, but also encourage you to read the report for further detail, especially at the, the sector level. So the first one is the overall projected energy consumption and associated emissions, and that includes the impact of policies and measures outlined in CAP 23 uh, in the WAM scenario. So though there's significant progress that's been made to date, and Lee mentioned the overall emissions reductions in 2022, uh, but the pace of reduction is unfortunately just not yet fast enough. Um, even with the full delivery of CAP 23, as uh, included in the WAM scenario, the energy sector is projected to still be off track to keep within its share of Ireland's uh, carbon budgets for the first two budget periods out to 2030. Ireland is also projected to likely be off track to meet the 2030 final energy use reduction target set by the revision to the EU Energy Efficiency Directive. So while we're making headway on improving energy efficiency and substituting fossil demand with renewable alternatives, 
This directive now requires overall capping of demand, uh, the trend towards larger homes and vehicles, the introduction of large scale additional demand from new sources like data centers poses an additional challenge to meeting the reductions that we need. Uh, our current product projections also indicate that if the 2023 climate action plan targets are fully delivered, the energy sector could is still technically deliver on its current EU 2030 renewable energy target of 34.1, which Carl showed us earlier um, for re overall renewable share. Uh, but the interim targets are unlikely to be met, and there's still a significant risk of implementation delay to kind of reaching that full renewable capacity necessary to do so before the end of the decade. Uh, there can be no slippage under the that WAM scenario uh, to meet that uh, meet that target, and that's before, um, as Cahill showed us, the introduction of Red Three, which will uh, further increase that requirement for Ireland's contribution to the EU's renewable energy target. Uh, so, as we've heard today, 86% of, of primary energy in Ireland was from fossil fuels. Um, and uh, in order to achieve Ireland's national climate objective, virtually all fossil fuel for energy use will need to be eliminated well before 2050. Uh, this plot shows our total energy use out to 2030 across our modeled scenarios. So, we projected that fossil fuels could still provide most of our energy in 2030, ranging from 68% in the WEM scenario on the left. Uh, to 57% in the most ambitious and optimistic uh, WAM CAP 23 scenario on the right. So total energy use is projected to increase slightly in the WEM scenario uh, and decrease slightly in the, in the WAM CAP 23 scenario. Uh, and the changing demand over time is influenced by the underlying population and economic growth uh, and by the impact of policies and measures and decisions made by citizens and businesses over the time horizon. So in all scenarios, renewables are projected to increase significantly and be the, the largest input to electricity generation by 2030 um, with the sharp increase uh, later in the decade. As you can see, um, the more ambitious scenarios as you as you go further right, um, the middle one representing the um, cap, an, another WAM scenario, but with the cap 21 um, targets. Uh, so the cap 23 scenario assumes a faster rollout of onshore renewable generation um, capacity earlier in the decade compared to the CAP21 scenario in the middle, uh, but it achieves broadly the same total share of electricity from renewable sources or, or res -E by 2030. Uh, so we've heard earlier today uh, about the tripling of the current variable renewable electricity generation capacity needed to meet our targets, uh, but this renewables trajectory also includes an unprecedented exponential ramp up of biomethane late in the decade to meet 2030 targets as well. So in the model, the assumptions for this set of, of projections, the pre previous one, coal is assumed to be phased out by the end of 2024 in all scenarios. Uh, money point is assumed to remain open to 2030, but switching to oil in 2025. Um, gas use then increases uh, in all scenarios to 2025 to meet that increased demand and to compensate for the assumed phase out of coal. But then it declines um, sharply in the second half of the decade as the delivery of variable renewable energy capacity begins to outpace the growth in electricity demand. So uh, moving on then to uh, emissions. So uh, we can see in this plot the annual emissions projected from energy use and industrial processes for the first two carbon budget periods for the WEM and the WAM CAP 23 scenarios. Uh, so it also il illustrates in red the indicative annual emissions trajectory that's required to stay or would have been required to stay within the carbon budgets from 2021 to 2030. Uh, the other dashed lines are used to illustrate a revised uh, carbon budget two trajectory that would be required to meet the, the sectoral emission ceilings if the, the WEM or the WAM CAP 23 scenarios were followed um, in those, those solid lines in carbon budget one. So when publishing the sectoral emission ceilings, indicative 2030 in-year emissions reductions for each sector were also published for illustrative purposes, which is the basis for that uh, indicative trajectory. Um, however, those in-year values assumed that the indicative uh, carbon budget trajectories met each year. So given the cumulative nature of carbon budgets, if a sector exceeds the initial assumed trajectory in any year, then the indicative 2030 emissions target would need to be further reduced to maintain a, com a compliant trajectory. So that's where you can see the kind of the steeper 
uh, adjustments that would re be required with those dashed lines. And, and we heard a little bit about what would be required um, earlier in the presentation by Lee. So then this plot gives us that picture of the cumulative emissions. So this plot shows the cumulative emissions trajectories over the first two carbon budgets uh, in the, the gray squares there. Uh, for the WEM, again, and for the WAM, CAP23 are our most ambitious scenario. And the black horizontal dashed lines show the sectoral ceilings for the first two car or carbon budget periods or the, the collection of them for energy sectors and industrial processes altogether. Um, the chart illustrates the, the years in which the sectoral ceilings are reached in each, in each scenario uh, and the cumulative exceedance ex uh, projected by the end of the second budget period um, and, and the first budget period is, is given there. So given these are based on last year's uh, historic figures, there will be some adjustment of that starting point and, and thus the overshoot figures as well in the next set of projections. But the message is still the same. The, the current projections indicate that the emissions trajectories in nearly all sectors will exceed the 2021 to 2025 ceilings. Um, hence, that'll require a more steep reduction in emissions within the second budget period, which corresponds to much lower in-year emissions um, by 2030 and, and a bigger uh, annual challenge. So the projected exceedance in the first budget period means that between 12% and 16% of the second budget would be consumed before the second period begins. Uh, in, in the WAM, WAM CAP23 and the WAM scenarios, respectively. Um, so the main message here is there's a significant challenge facing Ireland right now. We need to build on the momentum of climate action so far and the support of all citizens and businesses to accelerate the pace to meet this challenge as quickly as possible. Uh, we given the success to date and the potential to further increase the renewable proportion of, of electricity, the fastest decarbonization pathways for, for energy across Ireland, uh, mean that we need that significant electrification of, of heat and transport, uh, eliminating fossil fuels from electricity generation as quickly as possible, um, and also that, that uh, maintenance um, of, of existing demand and demand reduction um, is, is critical to success here as well. Um, so after you're finished with the Energy in Ireland report, uh, you can read more uh, in our projections report, um, but uh, look out for that new projections data set uh, at the beginning of 2024 in Q1. And uh, I'll, with that, hand over to Lee Carroll again to, to round us out with Q&A. That's, that's great, Emma. Thanks, thanks for that. And uh, sure, you, you might as well stay on the line with the camera on uh, in, in case we've got some, some questions that, that have come in. So we did receive a number of questions during the, the course of the presentation on, on the chat. So we're going to pull some of those out now and kick them over to the panel. But for those of us that are still on the call and still have a question, uh, there's still a time for you to, to get those in. So we'll be monitoring the questions uh, that are coming in as well. So um, one of the first questions we had in was from Anna Lawler and she was asking about the, uh, the transformation losses and remarking that the uh, transformation losses are so large, what can be done to minimize these or make better use of them? Uh, example, district heating. And um, as, as kind of I replied, and if other people on the panel want, want to riff on it, that um, those transformation losses, as we start to displace, displace fossil fuel with renewable generation, they will fall away because the, um, because the losses are, are, are much less in renewable electricity generation. And really kind of like uh, thermodynamics just means that once you're, you're burning stuff, be that heat, oil, coal, uh, or gas, there is always a loss associated with it. You, you never get a perfect transfer of energy. So while we remain dependent on burning fossil fuels for electricity generation, we will have high losses. And yes, of course, if there was any means that would um, kind of make, make economic and sustainable sense to recover uh, or capture some of that, uh, that transformation loss, and bring it into a district heating scheme that would definitely be be very very welcome so i don't know if anybody else on the panel would like to add anything anything to that no okay hanging me out to dry <laughs> no problem uh, there was another question from niall mccourt and he was asking the panel's uh, view on uh, hvo i guess for the renewable energy share and transport given that um in in the media uh, there's been some 
I, I guess, questions about the sustainability and the availability of HVO uh, and, and greenwashing uh, of, of palm oil exports or imports rather. And I guess what I would say there is that all of the, the HVO that's counted towards Ireland's res T uh, does come with the certification that, that kind of um, from, inter from international bodies that, that identify it as being sustainable and kind of as a backstop safety uh, break on that as well. There's a, a limit on in the, the res T or renewable energy share of transport calculation that, that limits the contribution from, from, from HVO. Uh, really, that's really to try and incentivize uh, more modern um, and advanced biofuels for, for blending uh, and biofuels that kind of don't, you know, kind of, kind of eat into, um, you know, agricultural uh, availability, availability of land. Um, and again, I don't know if, if somebody else, yeah, Cahill, please do yeah. jump in on that. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll just mention that um, there is a union-wide database, which is supposed to, uh, it, it's coming online in the new year, whereby member states can see the quantities and track the quantities of, of biofuels uh, between the member states. At the moment, everyone kind of operates their, their own separate system. They can't necessarily see uh, they, they have to individually communicate with other member states to, to move certifications around, I believe. So that is, at a commission level, I believe that's, that's seen as a key step in ensuring the, um, ensuring the, the, what would you say, the probity or whatever of, of the biofuels in, in the EU. Uh, but that, again, that database will be up and running next year. So I suppose we wait and see. Great. That, thanks for that clarification, Cole. And I, I think the Energy in Ireland report kind of covers exactly like the caps and the, and the limits on, on, on the accountability of different fuels into the different renewable energy share targets. Um, I, I guess maybe just trying to keep it very topical as well. I, I guess we, we had in the last 24 hours this, this decision being made in, in COP28 using the very diplomatic phrase of uh, transitioning away from fossil fuels. And on some of the plots today, we, we saw that. We saw that, for example, um, you know, biofuels for, for transport are slowly starting to displace uh, fossil fuel on the roads and that, you know, heat pumps in, in Irish homes are slowly starting to displace that uh, fossil fuel dependency there. So um, I don't know, Dennis, if, if you're on the line, I know you're, you're our kind of our heat expert, but do you feel kind of energized or validated from that, uh, from the wording that's come out from COP28 that the I know you, you were a key leader on, on the national uh, heat study from SCAI that the, the kind of the pathway that's highlighted in that document is, is kind of further supported by what's coming out of COP28. Yeah, like I think the kind of broadly been welcomed the kind of, you know, the wording, I think, you know, as I think everyone said, nobody got exactly what they wanted. And certainly I think, you know, most kind of developed Western countries would have wanted slightly stronger language, but, but clearly, um, look, we do have to fa fully phase out all fossil fuel use. Um, uh, you know, and, and the sooner the better, and, and especially the sooner in developed countries uh, like Ireland need to lead the way on that. Um, uh, yeah, so so absolutely. Um, Great, and maybe Shane from from your side of the house with the the focus on the EVs again. Is that is that music to your ears? Then there's that reinforcement of of, of displacing fossil fuels from from the economy, and I guess specifically from Irish roads as well. Does that give you a a boost uh put a spring in your step on this wednesday on wednesday morning yeah no a hundred percent it does like it's always good to see the reinforcement or the positivity that evs can actually bring to the decarbonization and the transport sector like i would also say that there's probably no silver bullets in the transport sector as well and it's not solely the electrification that's actually going to get us to achieving our targets but it's a combination like some of the questions mentioned there it's a combination of biomethane HVO, they're all going to count to get us to where we need to go. But given the kind of topology of Ireland, electrification is, of course, probably the most appropriate for Ireland at the minute. And uh, it's definitely great to see that vindication and that kind of support at a, at a global level for electrification. We just hope that uh, we can build enough cars to get, get them out to everyone who wants them. That's great. And uh, I'll segue into a question that just came in about four or five minutes ago that's looking for the, the panel's opinion on uh, elect the electricity interconnection um, and whether that will, uh, and this is kind of coming in from Hugh Dorgan, whether um, whether we 
well, whether we think that will continue into 2024 or will there be a kind of a shift in the in the ETS prices between Great Britain and the uh, the EU that will you know influence that and I, I guess um, I guess the answer, and I mean, you, you said this fairly elegantly, uh, Emma, is that we really don't have a, a crystal ball and really from the energy in Ireland and the, the statistics team, uh, we, we kind of do empirical measurements. So like, I, I guess what we're focusing on now is really just measuring what, what is currently happening. But I think maybe a point I didn't hit strongly enough is that um, while it's welcome that we're seeing a reduction in electricity emissions this year from, from kind of the increased use of imports, it, it for a long term dependable and sustainable reduction in in electricity emission reductions we need to be displacing fossil fuel generation here in ireland with with renewable generation like we cannot be relying on the imports from from other countries because market forces or eu legislation can change and the the driver for for that that um, or the advantage of using those electricity imports can can evaporate very quickly. So if you want to have that long term dependable uh, reduction in emissions, th there's no easy answer. It really is just the just the rollout of of, of more renewable generation. Um, yeah. Um, I'm I'm looking around to see if there's any further further questions. Uh, I, I don't see any that are that are popping up that haven't kind of been answered already in the in the chat. Do, do the panel have any other other, other comments on on, on on anything that we we've covered so far? Miley, uh, yeah, just on the interconnectors. Um, yeah, we our best estimate would that it will trend that way next year as well. Just purely on, um, I suppose it, the ETS is a tra it's it's traded, so you can get futures on it for next year, and the UK ETS futures are are much lower than the EU. ETS futures, so uh, a guesstimate would be that they will trend that way. It, it's impossible to say what will happen over the decade, but there is the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism coming in 2026. So we'll probably model an alignment from, from 2026. Perfect. I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, Porik, um, but like the, the CBAM means that it'll There'll be a kind of a, a leveling of of kind of carbon prices for so those countries that want to import or export from the EU kind of need to align to the carbon prices in the EU and so any kind of competitive or market advantage is is kind of smoothed out or, or remo removed through that mechanism. Yeah, to be be a tariff on the import. Yeah, to to align the carbon price. Yeah, so I, mean, I guess that's a kind of a key indication that. Th this import um, advantage can't go further than 2026. It's like at the stroke of a, a legislative pen, it, it will it will evaporate at least by then, if not before. Great. Uh, again, I'm, I'm frantically scrolling to see if I can uh, find uh, any any other relevant questions. Um, I think there's one that came in there from Phil Walker. Sorry. Yeah. Last one to come in. Okay, yeah. So th this is, um, uh, I guess, less of a statistical <laughs> question and more of a, of a policy one. But I'll read it out anyway. I might so, disagree with uh, the premise of the question, but they're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Phil Walker is asking the question: um, How do we get government to pay attention and take the necessary actions? Well, again, I, I wouldn't presume ever to speak for government. But what I would say is that the government obviously does take uh, climate change and, and energy sustainability very, very seriously. I mean, every year there is a revision to the, the national climate action plans to ensure that they're, they're current and timely. And um, I know Emma has been presenting to, to very senior officials in, in, in government, uh, explaining what the projections uh, and, and the modeling re results from SEAI's energy analysis mean, and using that to try uh, from an evidence-based perspective uh, argue and influence for uh, for 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 more um, I guess sustainable actions, such that the the projections that Mary, uh, that Emma was showing kind of that bring us to our 2030 targets. Um, so that's really I think one of the advantages here is that we're we're not just arguing for doing more. What the work of uh, Emma and the modeling team show is like where more work needs to be done, when exactly it needs to be done. And and if it is done, that we we do get back on track. I think um, 
one of the challenges that we see is is the um is are the other external events that impact the energy trends and fact uh, so things like covid or the russian invasion of ukraine high energy prices they kind of you clearly illustrated the impact that it had on on national energy consumption trends and it's really it kind of um puts it can scupper the best laid plans of policy very quickly, but it's important that we ourselves try and gather statistics as quickly as possible so we can feed back in to say what is happening to, in terms of energy consumption and energy uh, supply, uh, so that action can be taken. That's it. So yeah. With the modeling side as well, they have to, you know, consistent, constantly uh, keep track of these changing developments. Yeah, I definitely agree with that that point, Cahill. And I, I think that kind of from a data perspective, at least being able to provide that that evidence and, and take in new information um, just to make sure we have the latest and kind of respond to it. Um, that's an important piece. And, and I think also, especially from from the modeling perspective, because we have that greater level of uncertainty, I think it's yeah. also being able to kind of call out uh, the risks and and that's the importance of those kind of uh, sensitivities and in, and in, in scenarios and and looking at well what if there is a delay uh, in the rollout here like what does that what does that mean and and where we need to show that there's there's a gap to be bridged uh, and additional uh, work is needed so yeah 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 I mean it, it's really it's a little bit like analogous to to the kind of the weather effects on on heat like we we've had kind of Brexit, we've had COVID impacts, we've had the, the, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the resulting high high energy prices. So there, there's a, a huge amount of movement in, in you know, in, in energy uh, at the moment. And really it's it's challenging to pull out uh, where the, let's say the, the constructive, systematic, coherent improvements are coming from the policy when, there, when there's kind of so much movement in the system. And that's really why we work so very, very hard to, to pull those statistics out. Um, I see that we're three minutes over time, which is not bad, all, all things considering. Uh, um, and I, I, it's it's hard, kind of hard for me to to kind of read the additional questions when they when they pop in. So I think we, we might call it a day there. Um, we will try to respond if we've missed your question. Uh, we'll try to respond to it in in an FAQ that we'll publish after the fact. The Energy in Ireland report from the stats team and the National Energy Projections report from the modeling team, they're both available on the SCAI website, as are those really cool uh, videos for, for 12 to 15 year olds that, uh, that Emily, Emily mentioned. Um, so really we'd encourage you to visit the website, visit our resources, and uh, we look forward to, to speaking to you and answering your questions on the, on the next presentation. So enjoy your lunch, have a great Christmas, and we look forward to speaking to you again in the new year. Thank you.